everybody. Today, Rado runs through Dawn of Peacemakers, which is a cooperative story-driven game experience that is on Kickstarter right now, and I'm going to be doing a two-player run-through today so you can see what it's all about. Well, before I go on, I strongly recommend you turn your subtitles onto the Klingon channel, so if I make any rules goofs, you'll know what they are. Okay, have you done so? Then... Let's enter the dawn of the Peacemakers. And here I have got the first scenario set up. Now, as I said on the cover, this is a story-driven game where players will work cooperatively through scenario after scenario after scenario as they try to make their way through the big campaign booklet. And we're going to be in the first scenario today, Spark of Greed. I've already got the map set up and the units deployed. And what is the situation? Well, as it happens, because of a spark of greed, this is the first story after all, the Macaw Nation is unprovokedly invading the Ocelot Nation. This is a fantasy world of anthropomorphized creatures. Basically, it's the same universe as the Dale of Merchant deck builders, which I've already done run-throughs for. And so, the um, invading macaws are trying to strike fast and hard. And here's the deal. In this particular scenario, the ocelots had no idea that the macaws were coming, which is why at the beginning, their motivation is at four. They're scared. They're, this is just on the outskirts of their kingdom. There's an archer here in this tower and then two soldier units. One's kind of a hiding out in, these, uh, in, the, in this rock area. The other one's just totally out and open and exposed. And meanwhile, the bold macaws, who know they've got the element of surprise, start out with a motivation of six, which gives them a big leg up. And there are three soldiers, one over here in the forest, which means they're stealthy, and then the other three, the other two out on the plains, and there is the macaw commander, whose name is, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, can you speak Macaw? His name is Commander Sakmiak. Sakmiak. Or something like that. Anyway, he's a Commander Macaw who has special powers and different stats than the regular soldiers that he commands. So that's the situation. Now, Here's the funky part. Neither Jen nor I, in this two-player cooperative game, control the armies. The army units, they're here to fight and wipe each other out. We're here to stop it. This is me and Jen on this bridge, pretty much um, surrounded on either side by these army units ready to do battle, and it's our job to stop the fight. We are the peacemakers. Alrighty, so how do we do that? Well, um, let's go ahead and zoom in so you can see stuff a little bit better. I've got a starting hand of two resource cards, as does Jen. Oh, that's a little too far. We need to be able to... Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. So, I've got my starting hand of two cards. A lost missive and a lookout. Jen has got local contacts and a carrier pigeon. These are what we can bring to bear to try to stop the fight. Uh, also, I will be the first player. I've got the starring player token. And... Let's begin. Now, the way around works is, first of all, players can spend their resources in several different ways. I can use these resource I can use this lookout card to do its actual action, which is the companion units, any um, army units on either side that are in the same space as me, if I play a lookout, they will have stealth which means it's very unlikely that they will get attacked this turn. But instead, I could use this lookout card, not for the lookout ability, but to give myself three movement. Or instead, I could use it to give myself one influence. So these are multi-use cards. My lost missive here, again, I could choose a companion unit, one of the army units that I'm with. I am this, uh, you know, all the characters have uh, names and background stories and whatnot. I'm kind of this wise old counselor crane, I believe. If I were over here, hanging out with the commander, I could play a lost missive, which means I choose a companion unit, in this case the commander, because he's who I'm with, and I would basically force him to discard the top card from his order deck. Because if I know ahead of time that this is an order that's going to make him maybe wipe out one of the ocelots, which I don't want to see happen, I could have a lost missive so that the order gets lost. Because these are the decks of cards, the order deck, I'm sorry, the ploy deck and the task deck that the macaws use, and these are the ones that the ocelot use. Every round, each um, army 
is going to do something. They are going to do a task, and uh, which is what this card is, and how they do it is what the ploy is. After Jen and I are done doing whatever we're going to do, we're going to reveal four cards, two for each army. They're going to do stuff and basically try to kill each other. And hopefully, we will have maneuvered things such that we will either minimize the damage done or equalize the damage done. Because here's the situation. Over time, both of these armies are going to lose the motivation to fight. There are cards in their decks that make them kind of get tired and exhausted, and it makes their motivation drop. If any army has their motivation at one or two, they're ready to withdraw. They're ready to leave. If their motivation ever falls down to zero, they completely surrender. Now, if either side surrenders, then the other side wins. They're emboldened. That means um, the war effort is going to continue all the stronger. We don't want that to happen happen. We don't want either side to surrender to the other. That's just going to make the, the fighting more vicious later on as one side gets the leg up. We want to get both sides' morale down to one or two because if both sides are at the, we're ready to withdraw at the end of a round, they'll both leave and we will have stopped the fight. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to manipulate them. And along the way, and there's two main ways that an army morale drops. Like I said, there are certain cards that will just get them tired over time. I think they're called revoke cards, if I recall. You'll probably see some of them. And so I could be trying to get them to revoke their fighting that much faster so they're ready to withdraw. Or every time a, an army loses a unit, every time they're wounded and have to you know, leave the field, their motivation drops as well. And so the situation we find ourselves in in this very first mission is the ocelots, they're already down at four. They're ready to leave. And if they get routed and the macaws win, that's going to be bad news. So that's what Jen and I are having to deal with. And we play our resource cards to be able to move around, to influence the armies, to do special abilities, and let's see, uh, or to fortify areas. If I go to a given area and I play this card not as a lost missive, not to move, not to influence, but to fortify, that means if I know there's a unit that's about to be killed and I don't want them to be killed, like if I came over here to where this little soldier was, I could fortify by putting two fortification blue tokens here, and that means instead of him taking the damage, the fortifications will take the damage instead. So we are on a mission of mercy here, or at least manipulation, and let's see how it goes. I am the first player, and um, what am I going to do? Well. I can't do much from this bridge. I, both of us are going to need to move out and hang out with the army so that we can manipulate them. Because pretty much all, almost all these cards are always about affecting a companion that you are with. So, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Jen has local contacts, which lets her look at the top army card from any army. That's actually pretty nice. And she's got carrier pigeon. She's got two actually powers that don't have anything to do with manipulating an army. This, um, if she plays this, then I would get to draw a card and then give her a card in case she needs something specific on her turn. But it's my turn right now. And I think what I'm going to do, Jen and I agree, we're going to split up. I'm going to head west and try to manipulate the macaws and try to slow them down and maybe drop their morale because if they wipe out the ocelots that bad. Jen, she'll head east and try to um, raise them, or not raise their morale, but keep them from running away, keep them safe. You know, maybe she will um, install some fortifications in case they're going to get attacked, or maybe she'll try to influence them in different ways. Let's see how it works. So, anyway. I can play as many cards as I want. At the beginning of the game, I've got two. After my turn is over, I'm going to get to draw up two more cards in a two-player game. If I were playing solo, if I were here by myself, at the end of my turn, I'd get to draw four cards. If I was playing a four-player game, at the end of my turn, I'd get to draw one card. Basically, no matter how many players, at the end of a round, four new resource cards will have been drawn by the players in some combination. So, um, let's see. Honestly, I'm not worried about giving any of the macaws stealth because if we want any units to get defeated and you know run away and leave the battlefield, we want them to be macaws so that their motivation will drop further. So I think I'm going to use this lookout not to give them stealth, not to give influence, but instead to move. And that means I, so this goes in the discard pile, and I can move up to three spaces. I'm going to go one, two, all the way over here to, mm, do I go one, two, or do I just go one? 
Because here's the thing. I don't know if you noticed. I should say, by the way, I should have said this right up front. Everything you're seeing today is prototype. If you want to see what the final game looks like, go ahead and hit the eye in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes to go to the Kickstarter page. The most important thing is the real game is not going to come with placeholder standees like this. It's going to come with real three-dimensional miniatures. And these are, in fact, our pictures of what the miniatures are going to look like. This is what the Macaw Commander looks like with his little commander flag and his little uh, commander feathers and stuff like that. This is what I would look like. Uh, um, as my little uh, crane running around, uh, being a battlefield advisor. So, um, and the interesting thing is, when you're setting up and you're putting all the units out, the, uh, the, the game will come with rubber, let's see, I think there's a picture of it here, with rubber bumpers? Uh, whatever, what do we call these? I have no idea what you call them. Um, you'd think it'd say it right here, wouldn't you? All righty. Uh, right, but anyway, uh, they come with these rubber discs that you plug the miniatures into that indicate what overall unit the unit belongs to. So this Ocelot Archer could be in the round group, the spiky group, or the gear group. And that's how different um, units work in unison. And so, the, all three of these got all, all these regular soldiers, and here's what the real miniature would look like, are part of the smooth blue group. So, if I move into a space with any of them, that means I can manipulate all the soldiers. If I move over here, instead, I am manipulating the commander who's in a group all by himself, the uh, spiky group. If we look over here at the ocelots, the, the two soldiers, they're in the smooth group, and the one archer is in the gear group. So, they act independent. These two will act together. This acts independently. These three act together. So, even though I could move three and get all the way over to the commander, I think I'm more worried about these guys who are on the front line because they're very close to opening fire on the, um, on the ocelots. Now, if I look at the card for the Macaw Soldier, when they attack, they do three damage. They have a range of two. That's pretty much standard. All of the regular army units in this game have a range of two. So this guy can hit this guy, or one, two, this guy. This guy cannot hit the archer. In fact, none of the Macaws can hit this archer, but um, this one can hit either of these two. Um, you know, the Commander also has a range of two, so he can't quite reach anything. So, if the Macaws decide to attack this turn, this Macaw is going to hit this Ocelot, or this Ocelot, depending. There is a little thing here that reminds you of how they prioritize. I'll do that. I'll show you how that works when they attack. And by the same token, these Ocelots, both of these guys, are in range of these two, so they're both going to attack as well. And again, if anybody's going to go down, we do want the, we want the macaws to run away wounded because that'll drop their motivation faster. But anyway, so I could move up to three, so it's kind of wasteful. I'm only moving one, but that's the thing. I, this is a very powerful card for giving stealth. It's also a very powerful card for moving really far in case I've got to beat feet. But I think I'd rather leave this lost missive because it lets me do defense as well. It doesn't let me move as far, but it gives me more direct control over these guys um, in a way that might be more useful. So anyway, hmm. So I've moved in, and now I've got one more card. I could stop right now, but I haven't really done anything other than the fact that I'm hanging out. Who are we, by the way? You might ask. I should have said this right up front. We're the peacemakers. We are envoys of a powerful and mysterious and well-respected leader of the land. All the animal folk respect, I think his name is Marin. And so we represent him, and so that's if we talk, both sides of the army will listen because we speak for Marin. And that's why we can exert influence over these armies, and that's what I'm going to do with my other card. I could put two fortification tokens here, I could move some more, I could do a lost missive, but instead I'm going to exert a single influence, and I play this card. Now what that means is, for every influence I exert, if I, had, if I had, hadn't started on the bridge, if I had actually started out hanging out here, I could have played both of these to exert two influence, but I played one card to move and then one card to influence. What that means is for every influence I've got, I can draw and look at one of the cards belonging to the army that I am hanging out with. I'm hanging out with the macaws, so I can look at their ploy or I can look at their task. 
If I had multiple influence, I could look at, you know, if I had two, I could look at one of each of these, or I could look at two of these. You know, I have, I have a fair bit of flexibility about that. But right now, I only have one influence. This is going to let me know what they're going to do. Well, this lets me know what they're going to do. This lets me know how they're going to do it. I want to see what are they going to do. So I'm using my influence to look at this. And I can see what this says is, the, you, you can see it's the spiky symbol. So this means this turn, the commander is going to move move him forward. So all of these guys who I just moved in to kind of hang out with and manipulate, they're not going to do anything this turn. I know it's going to be the commander that moves. And if I look over here at his uh, thing, he uh, basically, oh, oh, he has a special power as well. Normally, they only move one, and yeah, he has no special move. So I know all that's going to happen is he's going to move right here, which is good. If this had said attack, I would know. Uh, if it said the commander was going to attack, I wouldn't be worried because the commander's way back here and he can't reach anybody. But if this said that the smooth group attacks, then I would know that, okay, the ocelots are going to come under fire. And that might be trouble. And I might want to do something about that. And I could, even though I don't have any cards. But since I've looked ahead and I can see it's going to be the commander that's going to move, I'm not really worried about this. But let's just say, let's look through the rest of the deck. And by the way, this deck, in the same way that I had to set the board up specifically as part, you know, with, with all, you know, I, I had to create the landscape and put all the units in the various places, I also had to set up their order deck to determine what it is they're capable of doing. Let me show you what that looks like. On, yeah, so yeah, here we are again, the spark of greed. And this little chart says that the macaws, the blue players, the, um, the commander, which is the spiky, in, the, in their order deck, there's one move, one take cover, and two attack, two strikes. And the same for their regular guys. So they have a total of eight cards plus a change of plans. So they have a total of nine cards in their deck. Um, four of those nine cards are an attack. Two of them are move, and two of them are take cover. So right off the bat, I have an idea of what this army is capable of. Same for the ocelots. I can see that, well, you know, interestingly, the round circles, which is the ocelot army, army units, they will move, they'll cover, or they'll attack. But the archer, which is the lone archer in this tower, the archer can take cover or it can strike, but the archer is never going to move, is never going to leave this tower. So we have some advanced knowledge of what each army's tactics are as part of setup, but I don't know exactly what they're going to do. But let's say this deck had been shuffled a little bit differently, and I had found right off the bat when I drew the first card. I didn't find this, which I'm not worried about. Let's say I had found a strike. And I'm like, oh no! The, the uh, regular army units where I'm standing, they're going to strike. And that means these guys are going to take damage. And I don't want the fight to happen. But here's the problem. I would like to influence them. But I didn't have very much influence. The, all the influence I was able to do was let me look at what they're planning on doing. I don't know how they're going to do it. And currently, I don't have enough influence to stop it. But when a player on their turn triggers an influence action to start looking at cards, after they've looked, if they feel, I need more influence, I need to influence more, which is, I need to look at more cards, all, the, all your other teammates can play um, influence cards as well to buttress it. So if I looked at this and I said, this isn't good enough, I could say, honey, could you influence? And she would go on ahead and say, yeah, I'll go on ahead and play both of my cards. But then that means she can't do anything on her turn because she's burned through our whole hand. But she might say, yeah, I'll give you one. And that means um, I will get another influence. And that means I can look at another card. And what I would do right now is I would look at the next card and I would see the next card is, oh, look, it's the commander moving. This is a safe thing. I don't mind the commander moons. I don't want the regular grunts to attack. After I've looked at all the cards I can spend influence, if there are more players, they might give me influence as well. I might draw some ploy cards. I might draw some more. After I'm done looking at whatever I'm going to look at, based on how much influence I spent and how much influence my teammates helped me with, I then can put all these cards back in any order I want. So I can stack the deck. I can exert influence and say, hey, 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 um, army guys on the front line, you don't want to fight right now. Wait until your commander moves up to join you. So I could put them back down like this, and now I know at the end of the round, the macaws are just going to have the commander move forward. And I avoided bloodshed right off the bat. But to do that, I needed to spend influence, and I needed the help of my teammate. Now as it is, none of that happened. I got kind of lucky. Um, let's go ahead and put this back and reshuffle because we don't know what's coming. They might have a change of plans. They might move. They might strike. Or they might take cover. I got lucky, and the first card I saw was, 
oh, yeah, it's the commander. He's just going to move forward. That's totally fine. I don't think I need to ask Jen to expend any of her influence to help me. I've taken a peek. I talked to um, you know, this regiment of, I don't know, 10 or 20 macaws, and I said, yeah, this is what we're going to, you know, we, we're not doing nothing. We're waiting for the commander to move up. And I'm like, okay, fine. You know what? I think I'm done. I played, I don't have any more cards, so I can't do anything else. And Jen's, I'm not going to ask her for influence because I've already looked. And so I just put this back where I found it. I, there's nothing to reorder. My turn is over. And at the end of my turn, I, in a two-player game, I draw two cards. So now I've got another lost missive and some food poisoning, which lets me move to, lets me fortify to, or I can give it to a uh, unit that hasn't been damaged and damage them. I can poison their food because maybe there's one unit that only has one hit point left and they're about to leave the battlefield. I can push them over the edge by giving them a little bit of food poisoning and they'll leave, which means their army's morale will drop, their motivation will drop, and we'll be one step closer to stopping this fight, just with a little bit of diarrhea. So, um, anyway, that's, this is stuff I can do in the future. That was my turn. It is now Jen's turn. She's got the carrier pigeon, which, now this is interesting. She could use this um, to choose me. I'm the only other player. I would draw a card, and then I could give her a card because maybe she doesn't like the card she's got right now. Although, interestingly, so if like, I had a card that was like a really big influencer, maybe I'd want to give it to Jen. She could play the carrier pigeon, which means I'd draw another, and then I'd give her one of my cards so she might have something that's a little bit more useful to her right now. Um, or she could do local contacts, which is interesting. She Normally, when you use influence, you can only look at the decks of the army that you're hanging out with, your companion, that you're being a companion for. Local contacts means you could look at the top card of any army's deck. So like right now, we know the commander's going to move forward, but we don't know how. If Jen wanted to, even though she's still standing out here on the bridge, she could um, call some local contacts. We could take a look at this. Or we could take a look at any of these, and Jen doesn't even have to leave the bridge. So she can keep her options open. Does she want to come out here and help me with the macaws, or does she want to come over here? Or she can play either of these cards to move one, to be hanging out over here in these, this rocky protected area with this soldier or this guy. I mean, this is the guy who's in trouble. So I think Jen will play one of her cards. Ah, it'd be nice to have the carrier pigeon, but I mean, she says, hey, do you have any good cards to give me? And I say, no, I don't right now. If I had like a big card that like did a lot of influence, I'd probably give it to her by via carrier pigeon, but I don't. So I think Jen's just going to play this for a move. She'll move over here and hang out with this army guy. And now, just like before, she has um, this card. She could play this to look at the top order. She can't look at ploys, which is the how, but she can look at the orders, the what, of anything. Or she can use influence, which would let her look at the um, either of these two decks. And the thing is, a single card won't let her change anything, but if she realizes something needs to change, then she knows, hey, I've got some influence I can throw your way. But then that means I don't have as many cards on my turn. So here's the thing. Jen's wondering, since the ocelots are already demoralized, Jen doesn't think she needs, I mean, whatever they're going to do, whether they're going to um, you know, move forward or just try to take cover, <clears throat> Or, oh, you know what, actually, and if Jen wants to, she doesn't have to move. She could keep this. On your turn, you play as many cards as you want, and then you're done. Uh, and then you draw back two at the end of the turn. If you want on a turn, you don't have to do anything. And instead, you can just pass, which lets you discard a card and draw a replacement card, and then draw two cards. So if, you, if you're like looking for a specific card, like if you really want food poisoning, because that's what you need, or there's other specific cards that let you do very specific things, and you know you need it, but you can't find it, your whole turn could be to pass, dump one of your cards, draw one, and then at the end of your turn, draw two more. So in a, turn, in a, three player, in a two player game, you're drawing three cards cards instead of two, because you're looking for a specific thing. But as it is, Jen's just going to use the carrier pigeon. She's going to move over here, and she's not going to manipulate them, because she's fine with whatever they do, because um, you know, chances are they're either going to move, well, she knows, they're going to move, strike, or they're going to dig in. So that's it. And so now, at the end of her turn, she draws two, so she'll have three cards next turn. Na um, natural materials. This is a... Um, a all right. Basically, she can basically ensure that any unit anywhere on the map 
can get to fortification. If they're about to die and we don't want them to die, because if they would die, that means their entire army would surrender, we can quickly deploy some natural materials wherever they need to go so that that unit is protected, even if we can't reach them. And then she's also got distraction. Move three, uh, single influence. All companion units here have minus one range. So, if there was a unit, and we know they're about to strike, because remember, by default, all units have at least a range of two, sometimes a range of three. These archers have a range of three, these guys have a range of two, and we don't want them to attack. We can distract them um, with uh, a smoke screen, it looks like, from this picture, and that means suddenly their range drops to one, and even if they were going to attack, they won't hit anybody. So this is a way that we can stall and wait for them to lose their morale thanks to being revoked. But anyway, so that was Jen's turn. And we are both done, and so now we are going to reveal what are the armies up to. We already know the commander is moving forward. We saw that, and I, I, you know, I went and I looked, and, but we don't know how. The commander is going to move forward in a regular way. There's all kinds of funky things here. He can, he can move here super fast, or um, he could, well, I mean, there's a lot of surprise. I, I, I'll, I'll wait and see if some more interesting stuff happens. So the commander is going to move forward. All the army grunts, they're not going to do anything. Over here on the ocelots, we have no idea what they're up to. Oh, revoked. Oh, no. Oh, they were going to strike. So they were going to strike, which means both of these guys were going to hit these guys and start whittling them down to make, make them run away. But Jen should have looked. She should have taken a look because revoked. Um, at the start, this is the, this is the bad thing. This is the losing more morale. At the start of the army phase, cancel the task. They're not going to strike and lower their morale by one. Oh my gosh, that is bad news, folks. So anyway, um, the way the army phase works is every army, or I should say both armies, reveal what it is they want to do. And now we resolve what order they do it in because at the bottom of all these cards are speed. Regular has a speed of normal. Revoked has a speed of immediately, start. But you know there, there are, there's fast, normal, and slow. If this had been instead, let's just say it was, let's just say it wasn't regular, let's say it was unexpected. Uh, you know, it could have been an unexpected move, an unexpected strike. And, oh, this is interesting, I didn't notice. It's a strike from the archer. You can see it's the little gears. So it meant the archer was going to strike, and they have a range of three, so they could hit here or here. Um, but it was unexpected, which means we roll the die to determine, um, and, and, and roll until a group with units is chosen, replace that insignia on the task card. So if this had been an unexpected strike, we might, Jen and I, we might have come over here. Jen might have taken the time to look and see, oh, it's a strike. Okay, good. A strike is good right now because we need to bring equilibrium. We could use some of these guys retreating so that we equalize the motivation. And we think, oh, well, good. It's the guy we know we want to strike. We know where he's going to strike. It's all fine. But then we reveal the ploy of unexpected, and then that means we bring in the die. And we roll until we either get a gear, which is what we were hoping for, or we get a smooth. And if we roll, oh, we, there are no starbursts, so we roll. And when it's a smooth, all of a sudden it's unexpected. No, it's not the archer who's attacking. It's the military guys who are attacking, and that's not what we prepared for. So you can see how these ploys, um, unless you take the time to look at them and influence them, usually when you influence, you want to influence the action because that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where somebody's going to get attacked. That's where guys are going to move forward or all sorts of things. But you got to pay attention to the ploys as well because otherwise something unexpected might happen. And in fact, that is what happened. Let me go ahead and shuffle uh, those two back into this deck. An unfortunate thing happened is revoked. Now, remember, I was telling you all that because the, things could be fast or slow or medium. If, um, if both of these were medium, then moves happen before cover, going, taking cover happens before strikes. So if this was if, if, they were, if this was a regular move and a regular strike, they both have normal speed, but striking happens before move. So the order would be this guy moves forward and then these guys strike. Oh, and that's interesting. That means the uh, commander moved right into the line of fire to these guys with a range of two who are going to strike because that would be the order things resolve. If, um, if it's the same, if it's the same speed and it's the same action, they happen simultaneously. But like I said, that's not what happened. Instead, revoked happened. And that's bad news. We have a problem, folks, in terms of bringing peace. This happens before any of the speed at the start. So they are not going to strike, cancel the task, and lower their morale by one. Oh, dear. Okay. And so... And so that happened immediately, and now, as we predicted, the commander is going to move up, and these guys are done. All these cards 
go to the discard pile of the various armies, and we have no idea what they're going to do in the second round, and it's time for us to go again. And now we have a big problem. We really have to make these guys more, bring their morale up. Now, there's a couple different ways you can bring morale up. One is if they can get to a castle or a tower. Because whenever a unit move, occupies a tower, their morale goes up. But um, right now, this is already occupied. So moving this guy in here would not bring the morale up. And interestingly, if for whatever reason this archer moved out, because you know they could, he could ford the river, because maybe that's what... Although we know that'll never happen. Remember, in this adventure, the archer is never going to move. But if we had a situation where, say this was reversed, and the macaws are really uh, about to run away, and the ocelots are up, we could come over here, whisper in this guy's ear, to you know, use a special power to make him move. We know he doesn't have a move in here, but sometimes we have cards that will let us make them move. We could force him to leave the tower by say, one of them is you can make them come with you. So we could say, you need to come with us over here, and he will. Because he left the tower, their morale would drop. And that's a way we could manipulate them. But then later on, if they ever moved back in, we, you know, their morale would raise back up. So that's a way you can manipulate their morale, by moving them in and out of towers and castles. But the other main way morale is adjusted is by, well, revoking, as you saw. So they're terrified. Um, they were already scared, and now they, they've even been more scared. So they didn't strike when they could. That's bad news for us. And that's on us, because if we'd had more influence, we could have foreseen the fact that they were about to be revoked and dug through the deck. Um, at least, though, at least we know. No, actually, that's not true. There are two revoked. There's another revoked in here. We have to make sure that other revoked does not come up because we can't let them have any more. And we need these guys to revoke. So anyway, so that was it. We are now on to the second round. Um, and things are not looking good. Oh, and also, this round, this moves on. Jen will be the first player. And she's hanging out with these guys. Um, and uh, let's see here. So what is she going to do? She's got three cards because she didn't use any. So Jen could play all three cards to trigger a, an influence action. And that means she could look at three of these or three of these or two and one. And she could make sure there's no more revokes. She could even, I mean, at this point, we want to get these guys to attack and maybe take out one of these units because then their morale will drop. And these ones will stay the same. And, um, and that would be a good thing. Or we could just leave them alone, and Jen could say, hey, you know what, let's go on ahead and use these to build up defenses. Because, hey, maybe we let their morale drop all the way into the area where we know they're about to retreat. Um, because remember, if, it's, if their morale is at one or two, they're ready to retreat. And if both sides have their morale at one or two, everybody will run away. Maybe we let their morale drop one more, and then we just fortify the heck out of where they are so they can't take any damage. And then they'll just, they'll be, they'll be terrified, hiding behind the fortifications that we built for them. And then meanwhile, I could be over here working on trying to demoralize these guys. And these guys could fight back so that they'll eventually get to where they retreat and we can win the game. Because the only way we win as the peacemakers is we get both units into here. If one unit completely surrenders, we lose. So we can't let that happen. And so that's why it's definitely a push your luck thing if one is really far down and the other one's still up. Then you have to really focus on them. So that could be kind of scary. And what is Jen going to do? Um, yeah, let's see here. This would allow her to make the ocelots not be as effective as an attacker, which is not great. Oh, by the way, um, so uh, we also know that one of the two strike cards for the archer is gone. There are now three strike cards left here. We want them to strike. We want them to wear them down, and we won't, don't want these guys to strike. Um, let's see. Maybe Jen doesn't do anything specifically. So she, uh, when I, on my turn, I've only got one influence. I need to control these guys, and it might be good for Jen to save these so she can spend more influence on my turn to try to keep them under control. What to do? What to do? Um, you, know, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. So far, I mean, there's been no bloodshed in this fight at all, and yet Jen and I have a very big problem. We have another problem as well. Um, or No, this is an opportunity, specifically. The commander, his special power is actually a special weakness because he is a cautious leader. If he is ever injured, which means, um, let's see, he has eight total hit points before he is defeated. If he gets down to four hit points halfway, he is considered to be injured. 
Um, most, it, for most characters, it doesn't matter if they're injured or not. It has no effect. But if he's injured, his side's morale drops by one. So if I could manipulate him to move out to the front, you know, if I had those cards that let me force him to move, or, or if I just make him move so that he comes under fire and he gets weakened really badly, then um, their morale will drop automatically uh, you know, by one which would be very, very cool. But the problem is, since the macaws do have a leader, if this guy gets completely wiped out, then the macaws will instantly surrender. So this is a push your luck element too. Strategically, we could try to, do, we could try to get the ocelots to do focus strikes on him. Um, I could maneuver him into position. Jen could ensure that they will fire on him. And we, once we get him down, then after he's wounded, I would try to manipulate him to pull back so that he doesn't die, but he will have done his job of lowering morale um, by you know, taking four damage, as an example. Or, uh, but again, if I just get this soldier who has five hit points, but see, that's the thing. I got to do five points, or I have to have five points of damage. You also have to have to do five points of damage to take him out to drop the morale. We only have to do four points of damage to get him down. And we have a problem because these macaws really have the upper hand because of that very bad revoke. Maybe if nothing else, Jen doesn't play anything this turn, so she's got a bunch she could play for me, and I just dig deep and try to find their revoke. If I can find them to revoke, then they won't do anything. Their morale will start to drop, and meanwhile, hopefully, the ocelots will open fire. But it would be good, though, for Jen to do at least, since she's here, to at least see what the ocelots want to do. So that that might affect what we, how we want to manipulate them. So, Jen will, um, since Jen doesn't want to make the ocelots weaker, that's not our situation right now, Jen will play this to do an influence of one, just to see what the ocelots have in mind for this round. Oh, I'm, I'm not supposed to look at ploys. Reshuffle that, because I wasn't supposed to see that. I mean, I could. I could look at their ploy, but I don't want to. I want to look at what their task is. This round, they're going to take cover. Uh, specifically, the archer is going to get plus two defense on this round. All right. So that, we know that, and now Jen is not going to do anything else, which means at the end of her turn, she's going to draw two cards, and really, she has a turn getting ready for future rounds. Okay, she got mixed groups and another distraction, so those might come in handy later, and she's also got four influence she could send my way if needed. Okay, so that was Jen's turn, and now it is my turn, and, all right, see, this is another thing, too. I could poison the commander right now. He will have lost two damage. I'm going to do that. Right off the bat, I'm going to, since the commander came to me, how fortunate is that? I'm going to, because remember, we are respected military advisors. Everybody in the kingdom um, trusts us and will do what we say when we manipulate them. So I'm going to say, hey, why don't you have this big vat of soup with a suspicious looking guy putting a fish bone in it? So I'm going to play that. Not for movement, not for fortification, but to poison the commander. And that means I take two of these damages and I put them here next to the commander. If the commander moves around, I move the damage with him to keep track of that. Now, if the commander takes two more damage, he gets injured, the morale drops, and then I gotta beat, I gotta get him out of there so he doesn't get wiped out. So that's a good start. Okay, um, and now for my other card, uh, I could choose a, a unit and discard the top card from its army's order deck. So I could just discard their top order. That's not going to do me any good because I don't know what it is. Um, so, plus, it could be a revoke. So I'm going to use, I'm going to influence again. And once again, I get to look at one card. And now I want to find the revoke as fast as possible. So I'm going to dig in here and hopefully it's the revoke right off the top. It's not. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to do it swiftly. They're going to do it fast. And so I look at this and I say, honey, this is not enough. If I'd seen this was invoke, I would have been happy. I would have had my turn over because I know they wouldn't do anything. I say, honey, I need some support. And now Jen, she has a bunch of support. She could throw my way so that I could go digging to try to either find um, their invoke so that they, and um, you know, but I mean, there's a lot of cards in here. Their invokes might be all the way at the bottom. Or I could look through their deck. I know that this deck is full of moves, cover, and strike. If I just want them to take a break, I, it'd be much easier, much harder to find the invoke digging deep here as opposed to dig here shallowly. I, and then I, not only do I see what they're going to do immediately, I could see what they're going to do for the next three rounds. And I could rearrange that, and we know what they're going to do for the next three rounds. And then we could build a whole strategy for the ocelots around that. Um, and I could, you know, if I, if I find a... Let's see, I know all they're going to do is take cover, so they're not going to strike. So if I have them move, I could have them move or I could have, as long as they don't attack, 
I don't really care. So I could dig through this, I could find that stuff, or I could dig through here and try to find the invoke, which would cancel whatever this is and bring them down. Um, ideally, if I could, I wouldn't mind finding the commander thing. Well, no, I don't want to move him any farther because he can already be attacked by both of these guys. And here's the thing, if both of the soldiers decided to attack, well, okay, the way they attack is, I didn't mention this. As part of setup, we use these little indications to indicate the, the direction that the army cares about. In this one, the macaws are going this way and attacking in this direction. The ocelots in the opposite direction. That's usually the case. But sometimes you'll have missions where, oh, no, no, maybe they're on a trade route and they're going this way and the other guys are coming in to try and attack them that way. So, you know, there are different ways that these can be used. But this one is the normal one where they're just coming in. And so, basically, if these soldier wanted to attack, you look at this and say, hey, I want to attack in the direction, my preferred direction, in space one. And if I can, if I can't, then I'll look all the way around until I can find. If I can't find anything one away, then I'll look two away. So it's kind of interesting. You know if they're going to attack where they'll strike. So um, we know that this guy says, hey, there's nobody next to me, so I'm not going to attack. Then I come out here, I'm going to attack this guy. This one is going to attack over here. There's two units to attack. If there are multiple units to attack, they attack the one that is the most wounded. So this guy, if he attacks, will hit the commander, do three points of damage. The morale will hit, will happen. And then in a future turn, if I can find the follow me card, I can pull him back to um, safety so we don't have to worry about him dying and the morale will have happened as an example. Um, so that might be a way to go, but I know this turn they're not going to do it. They're just going to take cover. They just have more defense. But even still, um, these guys hit hard. I don't want them to hit hard. So I'm still, all this is trying to decide what is the first thing I look, or I did. I looked at and I know it's swift. And now um, I have to decide when Jen some, some, so sends some support my way, where am I going to dig? What am I going to try and figure out? And then based on that, I think I really do want to dig through the tasks and find out what they're going to be up to. But then Jen's got to figure out how many of these is she going to play? How many of her cards is she going to give up? Giving up these special powers, a really fast move, all kinds of things so that I can dig deeper and really mess with the plans of the macaws. And you know what, folks? I think I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to leave it a bit of a cliffhanger and say that is what Dawn of Peacemakers is all about. A very interesting, very unique game. And if you'd like to hear some final thoughts, you can hit that eye up in the top right corner screen or follow the show notes in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.